All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Elaine Christian, and I'm a Sustainability Program Coordinator with the City of West Palm Beach Office of Sustainability. I am so excited that we have the opportunity to partner with the Cream Literary Alliance to share this program with you today. We have brought together so many amazing and talented writers and artists for today's program. Right now, there's so much going on in the world, and we wanted to share different mediums to be inspired by. Everyone relates to today's climate crisis in different ways, and we are also all motivated in different ways. So today you will experience poetry, prose, photography, and a special meditation. I wanna jump into today's program shortly so that we have enough time to get to everyone and hopefully leave you inspired. You will see that we will quickly jump from person to person throughout the program, and this is just so that we have enough time to get to everyone. The program may run a little past 1 p.m., but I hope you can stay a little longer in case you have any questions for us. Please type any questions or comments that you have in the chat box and make sure that you have selected to all panelists and attendees when sending. At the end, I'm also going to share a link to a survey in the chat box so that um, you can fill that out and hopefully um, give us some more information about what you liked about the program or anything you'd like to see in the future. Now, I'd like to introduce an amazing artist and poet, Roxanne Darling. I shall unmute myself and share my screen with you. <laughs> so I'm a uh, literary, visual, and conceptual artist, and I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And today I'm gonna be sharing a project with you that I call I Am for the Love of Nature. And the theme of my comments uh, is to listen, because this project that I'm going to share with you came uh, from my listening to nature as she shared uh, her messages with me. So I'd like to start by first reading my project statement to give you an idea of, of where we're headed here. So uh, I am, for the love of nature, are nude self-portraits uh, composed in the Western United States in my 60s. On the surface, they explore the solitude and uh, expanse of the unoccupied landscape. In earlier times, playing in nature provided solace and escape for me during and after childhood traumas. Women and nature have a lot in common. We are both revered and desecrated. These wild places encouraged me to explore personal and universal themes of consumerism, debasing things we love, and the issues of waste, trash talk, merchandising, and equating old and abused with useless. In the remote and quiet expanse, I listened to nature herself, unearthing power, peacefulness, and the present. So let's look at a few images. This first image uh, turned out to be a bit of a signal for me. Uh, it was made on the day of my mother's funeral I spent the last year of her life with her. Um, she was 92 and she lived in Palm Beach. And um, I feel like uh, this image, I had this, we were walking by this lake after her funeral and I had an urge to take my clothes off and create this photograph. I didn't know why, but I listened and I followed the urge and I realized that my mother was literally lifting into the sky, encouraging me to be free, to be myself. Uh, to be an artist, which she herself became in her 60s. We didn't even know about it. <laughs> so um, this image is the one we use for the event, and I call it saying goodbye to my merchandised self. And I would like to uh, read the poem that goes along with this. I never imagined I could feel so full of my own soul as to dwarf a container ship packed dense with goods and bads, ferrying stuff I no longer want and largely never needed. There were times I thought this impedimenta could salvage me from the trash talk I buried myself in. Bye-bye layers of masks and shiny distractions. Bye-bye all the roles I once wore to impress others or sell ideas. I'm staying naked to welcome the wind whispering to me, and I like the feeling of freedom on my skin in the morning. Uh, 
as a child, I used to love to go out into the woods and take my clothes off and make a new wardrobe out of leaves and vines. As a college student at UC Berkeley, I was a uh, environmental activist and a bona fide tree hugger. So when I came upon this fallen tree in the woods in Northern California while out on a two month RV trip with my partner, Shane, uh, I literally heard it speaking to me. But as it was so close to the parking lot, 300 steps away, um, we decided to keep hiking and look for another tree. But on the way out, this tree was the one that really wanted to speak to me. And so here's the poem um, that I received from nature. As I entered the old growth forest, the wood nymphs whispered my name. I kept walking, they kept talking. Here now, I asked. What are you waiting for? They answered, this is the present. With this image and this poem that came to me, I realized this is the point of this project, is to be a channel for nature, a conduit for nature, and to examine how we desecrate ourselves with our own negative self-talk and how I think that impairs our ability to care for the planet, for nature itself. Um, you've all probably heard about this. It's become very popular information now about these fungal networks that are in the soil that allow trees whose roots are not even touching each other to communicate with each other. And so the more we learn about nature, the more we learn it is such a gorgeous um, holographic system. And there are so many ways to communicate. And so I invite you to listen to the trees because they may actually have literal messages for you. Another thing that's been studied by science is what the Japanese call Shinrin Yoku, which is the art of forest bathing or going into nature to receive the healing benefits of nature. And it's wonderful time that we live in because these things have been studied and there are so many demonstrated physiological and psychological and emotional benefits for being in nature, better sleep, lower blood pressure. Um, and so whenever you can get out in nature, even if it's just for a short while, even if it's just outside, even if it's just sitting in your window, letting the sun shine, um, sparkle on your face. This is in uh, Joshua Tree uh, a National Park and uh, this place just you know there's there's no bad pictures you can take at Joshua Tree it, it's such a gorgeous place but in studying and researching about the Joshua Trees to see what they had to tell me um, I realized some very special things, and so that's what I wrote the poem about. The female yucca moth pollinates the yucca tree, the Joshua tree, and laying her eggs in the flowers, those little eggs hatch and feed on the yucca seeds. Neither would exist without the other. Nature, no, but not I without her. I want to be part of this cycle of sharing, of blooming, of mutual dependency, of feasting in the wild. Nature is my safe word. Nature is my safe place. So being that I lived in Palm Beach for a year with my mom, fashion is a really big thing. <laughs> fashion is also a major contributor to global warming. And so I invite you to listen to Kate and your funny friends. Um, there was an article that she wore this green uh, blue coat for four times. And so the people on Twitter had a lot of fun with this. Um, I've been wearing the same pants for eight years. <laughs> Another person said, if I had that coat, I'd sleep in it and get the mail in it. And a gentleman said, I wear the same blue shirt to work every Wednesday. So, um, you know, the issues of consumerism certainly play into the global warming challenges that we have. 
as well as our own self-esteem. We think that it's the outer wrapping that makes us who we are, but in fact, it is the inner essence that makes us who we are. Um, and in case anyone is curious, it is legal to be naked in the national parks. So you have the opportunity to um, forego all clothing if and when you choose to do so. So letting clothes get older uh, doesn't mean that they get bad. And so this is a poem about age. I call this one discussing age at sunset with a saguaro. I learn the saguaro stands singular and self-contained for up to 90 years before growing an arm. I mentioned that I've often felt like a puppet, too many arms tangling in things I don't really care about. Sun setting, tucking my arms in, still standing, still listening. So to wrap up my little part here, um, I'd like to briefly mention I have a book with my poems and photographs, and I'll put a link uh, in the chat if anyone is interested in that. And I've also uh, got a one minute meditation with forest sounds and some of the abstract uh, photographs that I've made and a few other images. So I invite you to just take one minute and breathe with me and listen to nature. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roxanne. Now we're going to turn over to Richard Emery. Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, that's good. Well, uh, I'm retired in uh, cold weather in Boynton Beach, and right now I'm in Baltimore, uh, which is my natural home, I guess. Uh, I, I was once our nation's top lawyer for all EPA uh, investigations of pollution crime in the United States. And uh, by way of further introduction, I, for 17 years after that, worked in foreign affairs globally for the U.S. government, teaching other countries how to achieve clean air and clean water. Uh, and uh, in retirement, I've become a, an old book peddler so here, here's my book cover. Uh, it's entitled uh, Fighting Pollution and Climate Change, an EPA Veterans Guide, How to Join in Saving Our Life on Planet Earth. And that is my badge, but it's an honorary badge. I was not a special agent. I was a legal advisor. But that badge uh, is one of my proudest possessions. Uh, so my story begins in the state of Maine in 1949. And just for fun and authenticity, <laughs> Uh, I will read uh, just the first two paragraphs of my short paper in the accent of the Maine coast of those days, and then I'll, then I'll revert to my normal mid-Atlantic voice, which you're hearing right now. Uh, so my piece is entitled, it's about a page of prose, A Childhood Foretelling. So here we go. At the sounding of the horn, some women, permanent residents of our little town, grabbed their sharpest knives and rushed out their front doors. In the street, they were joined by hungry cats and excited children like me, eight years old and attracted to the commotion. We all rushed down the road to the harbor to see coming in from the ocean, the sardine transport boat arriving at what we call the fish factory. 
Being halfway down east on the coast of Maine, the town women anticipated a rare payday. The year was 1949. After being lifted out of the hold of the transport boat, the little fish would travel down a long watery sluice roofed over to keep out the gulls. The smells, sights, the sounds, the squawking gulls, the meowing cats, heavy motors running, the women talking and their eyes flashing as they worked, throwing scraps to the cats, water rushing down the sluice. It was all irresistible to me and the other town children assembled there too. Then the sardines carrier's hold was emptied, all was packed, and the fish factory became quiet again. In their homes, the women put some cash in their dresser drawers and resumed preserving summer fruits and vegetables to keep in their cellars against the long, lean winter to come. And all too soon it would be September, and I would be taken 600 miles south to my parents' home in Baltimore. After a long school year in a big city, finally June would come again, and I would return to live at my grandmother's home at the harbor. Another summer had come to the main coast, and then would come another, but the big sardine boat never returned. The fish factory became a boatyard for building and repairing the yachts and small pleasure, pleasure boats of a summer people. Now, fish factory processing jobs were surely tough, low-paying, and intermittent. And in 2010, the last main sardine factory closed. Now, whether the year-round people of the town consider this to change to be for better or worse, I cannot say. Uh, to me, though, the arrival of the sardine boat is a shimmering memory of big excitement and during carefree and glorious summer days. But a way of life was ending. And in 1959, my childhood would end too. Now, long since I had been so lucky as to have been a summer child living on the main coast, I wondered why did the sardines disappear? Today, I contemplate the fish factory as the irreplaceable loss of a working marvel. And now we know that around the world, many fisheries have been exploited to the point of commercial extinction. Man-made plastics are being eaten and killing marine mammals, birds, and fish. And scientists say that in a few de decades, there will be a greater weight of plastics in the sea than there will be of fish. As the climate changes now in Maine, it's possible in future decades that the lobsters and clams may disappear like the sardines too. Now, the Gulf of Maine is warming as fast as uh, uh, almost any place. Uh, and in 50 years, for today's children now on the main coast, uh, digging at low tide for clams and seeing the lobster boats coming and going, these two may become just shimmering memories of a colorful way of life gone by. Now, the mystery and the beauty of the coast certainly affected me. And 40 years later, I found myself serving as our nation's top lawyer for criminal investigations by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And I also told you in my introduction, I then worked uh, globally in foreign affairs for EPA for 17 years. And uh, I, I've seen a lot, I can tell you, uh, including uh, too many man-made insults to nature and of course, oncoming climate chaos. Now our planet is in danger of losing its life. Paleontologists and geologists confirm that since life on Earth began about half a billion years ago, there have been five mass extinctions caused by nature before man arrived. Uh, and in at least four of the past extinctions, carbon dioxide in the air exceeding a thousand parts per million caused the oceans to become poisoned by deadly hydrogen sulfide. And this chemical being emitted from the sea when it could no longer contain it all as gas turned the air permanently green and most life on land was over. Now, if we continue burning fossil fuels, leaking also leaking methane and refrigerants and other chemicals, it's not just CO2, uh, uh, we are thoughtlessly damaging the air and the sea and uh, the 
climate in the same ways as nature caused previous extinctions. And being as we are, the Earth's most invasive species, humanity is obliterating other creatures at an unnatural rate in what's called today the sixth extinction. And I, I recommend Elizabeth Colbert's book with that title, The Sixth Extinction and Unnatural History. It's a great book. At the present rate of poisoning the air, in about 200 years, it is likely that our man-made air pollution will reach the levels to poison the sea and then the sky. And if my generation and today's leaders continue business as usual, the last people to live on Earth will be our great-great-great-grandchildren. And then, like the sardines of Maine, we will all be gone, never to be seen again. We will have completed the sixth extinction. Well, that's the end of my reading. Uh, and as an afterward, let me just say this. Uh, social science uh, suggests that doom and gloom messages tend to disactivate people. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to leave you in despair. And personally, I'm very, I'm very optimistic and chirpy. And there's so much we can do uh, that is hopeful and with solutions, uh, such as look at some of the legislation even now, the Energy Innovation Act, uh, a bill pending before Congress. And you will find many more solutions in my book uh, at uh, fightingpollutionbook.com. Uh, I hope we can all join together and uh, stop the sixth extinction now underway. And thank you. Thank you, Richard. And I totally agree. Um, and if everyone is, a, all of our attendees, if you're able to view your chat box, um, Roxanne has been dropping some very helpful links in there um, for, and she'll be continuing to do so for, for the others that we have today. And now we're gonna pass it on over to Eduardo, who is a poet and board member of the Cream Literary Alliance. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Eduardo Condes and I write poetry. Therefore, I guess you can call me a poet. Uh, I have been writing now for some uh, 40 years plus. Uh, I was born in Puerto Rico, arriving to the mainland by the age of four. And Chicago was my hometown before coming uh, to South Florida in 2005. Well, I now reside hoping that this will be my last stop. Uh, environmentally speaking, uh, Richard, <laughs> sign me up, man. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to read three poems. Uh, they're kind of quick, so I won't take up a whole lot of time, folks. Uh, my first poem is called South Florida. South Florida, where weeds grow in the air and the sun burns with its sultry, salty, sanding and lingering humid scent that feels real good on the skin, on the soap, naked like the ocean when she inhales and exhales from both sides, east and west and way, way down south. Another day begins, another night ends, and tomorrow's come along much sooner than before. But always with a very warm, sometimes hot embrace, South Florida style, so you can stay a while and laugh again. This one is called uh, Poetry in Flight. And I guess I was trying to get poems that were going to be in the theme of what we're dealing with here, so. It's called Poetry in Flight. And when the grand monarch butterfly slowly breathes in and breathes out, and when Mother Nature again gives birth to its wings spread wide, so it cannot hide its beauty and awe, and eyes of angels smiling, can you hear its song being sung in harmonious glory at full strength, while it dances with a soft and sweet breeze across the orange and purple and red and brown sky, this butterfly this blood to fly that becomes her majesty long lives. And my last poem is uh, one that I actually read at the uh, first event at the Norton. Uh, it's called No More Prayers. No more prayers on climate, while the U.S. West Coast is burning, while the U.S. East Coast is drowning, and the oceans are surging and churning all over the world. Tears swollen across the ununited states of this America, and no one listens to the song being sung by the wind. 
and no one listens to all the trees crying in pain and in anger and hungry for hope as they cling to the notion of every motion and lost emotion from Mother Earth as she weeps, as she weeps and keeps us grounded until we become dust or bones broken and swallows us all. No more prayers, please. Just fight for the right to breathe again, pure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo. All right, now Amy, you ready? Let's unmute you. Hello. There we go. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm really enjoying listening to the art and seeing you. Uh, I'm Amy Dayhan and I am mostly retired. I walk every day and I often write in my diary observations of what I see. There's big things happening around us, uh, but there's also a lot of little things. This diary entry is called Down by the Pond. My condo community features several well manicured lakes and ponds. The back pond flanks a privately owned golf course. I assume that it is owned by the golf course because at one time it was not manicured. It was wildly overgrown with cattails and water lilies. It was a great place to lose golf balls and to watch for birds and wildlife. Alligators and otters frequented the pond and lounged on its banks. Purple gallinules and Jesus lizards ran across the lily pads. Two years ago, a pair of magnificent sandhill cranes nested there to the delight of everyone in the community. You would have thought we laid the eggs ourselves. We were so proud when they hatched. After that successful nesting, the private golf course was sold. The new owners were aggressive about clearing the old landscape, replacing old trees and clusters of undergrowth with stumps and clumps of sticks devoid of foliage. The pond was stripped mechanically and treated chemically to prevent new growth. The gallinules and Jesus lizards are gone and I haven't seen the otters. The cranes, however, returned and rebuilt a nest in the same spot as the year before. A sandhill crane nest is just a loose pile of reeds pulled from the boggy surroundings anchored by the vegetation growing around it. Mated cranes will tend their nests together, pulling and adding a few dead rushes each time they turn the eggs and exchange places. In the stripped down pond, the crane's nest looked ridiculously exposed. An egg was produced, but somehow disappeared, and the nest was abandoned. A year later, I am still watching the pond. The thick, bare, sinuous lily roots have a few stunted sprouts on them. Because the spring late rains are late, I can see a lot of golf balls blooming in the mud near the banks. A hillock overlooking the pond sports a stump with one crippled green sprout shooting out of it. A half buried golf ball lies in the dry dirt and sparse grass, truly in the rough. A pair of sand hill cranes is walking down the green. Stately and relaxed, they strut over to the hillock and peer down at the old nesting site. Don't do it, I think to myself. Crane's knees bend in the opposite direction of the human joint. I watch as one of the birds folds her legs backward until she's standing on her knees looking at the pond. After a few moments kneeling, she settles back to rest her whole body in the dirt. She gracefully arcs her long neck over and down and rests just the tip of her beak on the earth 
It is like watching a saint surrender into prayer. The second bird is close by, but has his back to her gazing across the golf course. Then he too kneels and folds down into the dirt. He swings his long neck around to rest his head on his back with his uh, beak pointing straight at his mate. He watches her as she begins idly picking at the short, dry, stubby grass, plucking one little blade at a time and dropping it again. I know I am projecting my feelings on the birds, but it looks like they are deep in recollection. Are they mourning the egg they lost? Are they pulled to the old nesting site the way humans might visit a childhood home that has become derelict from neglect? Does not all life share the urge to mate, to create, to build, and to protect? Some unseen signal pulls both birds to their feet. They simultaneously raise their beaks to the sky and cry out, ooh, loo, 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 then calmly strut across the rough to the empty fairway again. Thank you for letting me share that with you. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay, now let's turn to Ellis, um, who is a ballet, yoga, and writing teacher in Juneau Beach. Hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I have two poems to share with you, and the first one is called Four Amulets for a Frightened Floridian. And it was inspired by an article I read um, about amulets and charms used for good fortune and luck and protection that were found in the ancient city of Pompeii. And I, it made me wonder how that could be translated to amulets regarding climate change if they were found on our beaches um, someday in the future. Four amulets for a frightened Floridian. Number one, sea turtle bone. Slip it under your tongue and you will see inside the domed ceiling of a carapace with painted prophecies of water, the brilliant blue of morpho butterfly wings. You may feel the water's velvet curl as it rises and encircles you swaddling comfort lulls like a mother's song as it seeps past your lips, growing wider and deeper until you are lifted up and away by the hem of the wind. Number two, coral tentacle. Break off a piece the color of the belly of a warty newt at moonrise. Clasp in your hand, palm up. Witness the color drain from your hair and eyes, acid bleach from vivid honey and chestnut to limestone gray. The colors pool at your feet, mixing into roomy variations of pale, and you find your pockets jingle with glittering gold coins. Number three, python tongue. Dry and pulverized to powder. Mix with seawater and drink at low tide on the eve of a storm. Do not glance away from the news channel until you hear the bullhorn on your street. Evacuate to the darkened beach. Dive in the waves and reappear monstrous muscles slither as you call and constrict your forked tongue around the eye wall of the storm. Number four, egret egg. On starless nights, certain eggs, the color of a long-tailed parrot, become warm. The concentrated cauldron of heat expands until they whistle like tea on the stove. When you hear the high-pitched notes pierce the air, you will become flushed, your cheeks like a scarlet ibis, and the sting of salty sweat will fill your nose, ears, and eyes until you can no longer smell the sizzle of your skin. 
And the next one is called, last one is called Indifferent, um, which is about the obvious evidence of climate change that is all around us and our uniquely human way of being indifferent to it. Summer finally begins to lay down her saber swords of heat in August, just as somewhere in Africa, a carpet of Saharan dust rides the trade winds west and starts to settle over the amniotic water of the Atlantic. As if the atmosphere needed a better invitation, the wind shear slowly dies and the sea level rises. Moisture lifts and twists in a howling dervish dance. A fevered pitch of swirl and heat never seen before. Now we are indifferent to this ostentatiousness, barely a nod from our striped beach towel on hot sand, slathering sunscreen on to protect us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. Now, let's turn it over to Laurie, who is an award-winning poet and film producer. Laurie, I think you're still, let's unmute you. <laughs> Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wait, let me. Okay. Um, hi, thank you all for coming. Um, I am a retired teacher and now a full time poet. And um, I'm reading from West Palm Beach today. And um, the planet has changed so much in the past few years. So I'm going to go back to 2011 when I was living and working in Japan. And I was there for the uh, big tsunami and uh, nuclear power plant meltdown and earthquake in the 2011 earthquake. And my first two poems are a result of that experience. Uh, the first poem is called A Basket Set on the Shore, remembering the March 2011 tsunami, Japan. An ordinary day until it wasn't. Go up, they said, to higher ground. Her body was never found, disappearing from the rooftop, the closest place to heaven. Years later, a mother still searches, rebuilding a life becomes routine. And daily, the ocean reminds her. Her daughter's days were far from extraordinary, but gentle, like the tide, during the crescent moon. The mother makes an offering each evening, salted plums, bean cakes, ginger tea, placing each item in a basket set on the shore. And as morning has no geography, heading home, her back to the rising tide, she does not watch as the sea eats. And the next poem is called The Blue Butterfly of Fukushima. And um, it has an epigraph under the title. It's um, by the Chinese poet Shang Su. And uh, the epigraph goes, I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. The Blue Butterfly of Fukushima. Within a year, the blue butterfly changed barely noticeable, yet the wing spread limited, the markings on the underbelly a faded hue. Shorter antennae, dented eyes, its pale grass blue color muted. The butterfly flies, but within boundaries, much more like man now, unequaled to the blue in an endless sky. And now I'm gonna bring you to Los Angeles. And um, in the spring of 2019, a great thing happened in Los Angeles and they had a lot of rain, which was um, unprecedented and unexpected. 
And so this is a response to, the, oh, and then when the rain came, uh, the um, a great migration of painted lady butterflies happened. And you could see butterflies all over whenever you walked. There were just hundreds in the air. And so this is a poem um, called Butterflies and Sirens. And it's a response to the sudden migration of painted lady butterflies to Los Angeles in the spring of 2019. I was there for the rain, but left before the early bloom of nettles and mallows, was absent when the angel-voiced siren of Los Angeles taunted the painted ladies north to feast on lupin and milkweed, everywhere the cloak of orange. Their black wing-tipped eyes staring down at the amazed denizens while skimming by buildings and bike racks and bus horns blazing, hundreds in midday light hovering while the sirens of the city blared through this place of comings and goings, drawing all to look closer at the shock of arrival, the surprise of flight, and a noon epiphany, the sirens calls no longer in a place of drought. And speaking of droughts, um, these next two poems are my pandemic poems, well, some of my pandemic poems um, written since the pandemic. And this one is called What Sent Our Way. And this also has an epigraph under the title, and it's from um, uh, a poet, my poetry, my late poetry teacher who wrote a letter to one of our students. And it said, the, the letter says, how does one endure, survive, adapt, accept with grace what's sent our way? What's, what's sent our way? We must endure. We rise each morning to the same sounds, birds among motors keeping us moving forward. At times just noise, but now a welcome reminder, we are still here. We must survive. It was never easy to maneuver through all the tricks and facades learned through the years. They all worked up until now. We must adapt. In our evolving lexicon, a new C word, more horrifying than the other, Corona. It can be beautiful, a pearly glow surrounding the darkened disk of the moon. Yet every beautiful thing decays, even gilded points of a crown wear thin. And then there's grace. This is the hardest part, to relinquish power and with sweeping wings fall to land into the hurdle, then attempt to rise in the face of what sent our way. And my last poem, thank you for your patience. <laughs> and my last poem also written um, recently during this pandemic, and it's called Poem to the Unborn Child During a Pandemic. When I think future, it's a wisp of thought on the wing of the lone monarch hovering and unleashing an imagined tomorrow around the milkweed. What will you see of this world? Today in the quiet distance, the world blooms against the trill of a yellow rumped warbler and cicadas at dusk. The dormant bougainvillea surprises me with a purple thrush of crested petals. How will this world crown you? Coming to those who live in these times, learning to embrace the future in tiny conceived moments. Thank you for listening. And uh, more of my work can be seen on my website, which will be posted, I guess. So thank you very much. And uh, let's hope that we are all going into a uh, more graceful, embraced future. Thank you so much, Laurie. And last but not least, we have David. And David is a former commentator for NPR and a research scientist. Uh, 
Okay, good. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, this is an excerpt from my Cli-Fi novel on Vestige Way. I'll change my glasses. Um, Sylvia and James are physicists working for the World Federation, a uh, kind of super corporation with a monopoly on clean energy production from laser fusion. The Thwaites ice shelf has just broken off from Antarctica, catastrophically allowing land-based ice to slide into the sea. So this is from On Vestige Way, available at Amazon. Sylvia woke, gasping for breath, crying out to James beside her. It was 3.12 a.m. Sylvie, what is it? He said, putting his arms around her. Hush, I'm here. It's okay. It's okay, he repeated, trying to comfort her and bring her from wherever she had gone in her sleep back to him with his arms around her. Sylvia pressed her face into his chest and warmed to her husband's familiar embrace. Gradually, she calmed, but the vision that jolted her from her sleep was still vivid in her memory. Oh, Jimmy, it's just too terrible. The floods, the famine, all the dying. James Marshall held her close. He realized that Sylvia had pushed across that barrier, that protective wall that allowed her, allowed anyone to function in the midst of horror. James pulled her closer to him, kissed her head, resting on his chest. I feel like we've all been cursed for what's, what we've done, that maybe there's some karmic account that's being settled that we can't escape. I can't stand it. She began to sob. James gently pushed her from him. Come on, Sylvie, let's go talk in the living room. I'll fix us a couple of drinks. He took her hand and led her unresisting from the bed. He guided her to the couch and waited until she had settled in. Then he went to the liquor cabinet and prepared two scotches. He said nothing for several minutes, letting her quietly sip her drink. How can you stand it? She finally asked him. James held his wife closer. I just go day by day by day in my job and in my life with you and Jonas. James stopped to look at his wife more carefully. What's going on at work that brought on this sudden dread? I know you're working on a secret project. Sylvia gave a deep sigh. Basically, it's hopeless, and I don't see that there's any bright future for any of us. She handed him, she handed her empty glass to James and held up her pointy finger, showing one more. Rising quickly, James prepared another round for them both. Sylvia swirled the, the refilled glass of scotch, watching the motion of the two ice cubes. Jimmy, it's about our son. It's like I'm watching him catch a fatal disease. I want to protect him, to rush him to somewhere safe, except there is no, nowhere safe. James moved closer to Sylvia and put his arm around her again. We had such high hopes in the beginning, she said, with the formation of the World Federation, science to the rescue. Well, it didn't turn out that way, but that doesn't mean we give up. It's just that everything is so unprecedented. There's nowhere to look for guidance or fresh ideas. Her eyes watered, watered up again. It's too painful to bear. Darling, that's why I keep a short time horizon on all this. We'll go crazy if we think too far down the road. I can't do that, Jimmy. I don't understand how you can do it. We're both scientists. We can't just pretend that what we know will happen will not happen. James was out of comforting comments and remained silent. Sylvia finished her second scotch. I need another way of looking at this, something that makes more sense than just that we're screwed. She thought for a moment and then continued, I can't just stumble through this with no understanding of where it's going. I've been thinking about the Gaia principle lately. I don't understand, James said. You don't believe that Gaia nonsense, do you? Now, I think I do. I'm thinking everything that's happening is just a consequence of some of our terrible behavior and that Gaia, Earth as a whole, 
can possibly act with intent in response. I know, believe me, I know you think it's too anthropomorphic. I used to think so too, that it's crazy to understand what's happening as somehow an intentional act by nature. James shrugged his shoulders. Go on, he said. Now, I'm reaching here, Jimmy, because I need a logical trajectory for all this. I'm just thinking out loud. Let's say, just for argument, you know, what if Gaia, if the Gaia principle is true? What if Earth and everything on it are actually, uh, and anything on it actually are components of one big organism? Jimmy, maybe it's possible all these disasters are happening because one of the interacting parts of the organism, us, has knocked the whole thing out of balance. Everything we are experiencing is Gaia, the entire organism, the biosphere, including us, the geosphere and the atmosphere, seeking to establish a new equilibrium, a new homeostasis. She smiled, thinking, uh, uh, she, she paused, smiling at the thought that came to her. It's just physics with a purpose. They both laughed. Okay, okay. What is it here that, as far as we can tell, is unique to the whole damn universe? It's life. And all this horror is just Gaia doing what's necessary to keep life from disappearing. That makes sense, doesn't it? Geez, Sylvie, whatever gives you comfort, I guess. I don't know what to say. It all sounds like a revenge theory to me. Jimmy, maybe, just maybe, that we're too used to thinking of humans as the most important part of life on Earth because we believe that we alone, of all the forms of life on earth, have a destiny, a purpose. It's arrogant and it's wrong. James stared silently at Sylvia. He rubbed the stubble on his chin, thinking how to respond. Wow, he said finally. Where did this come from? The bottom line is still we're all screwed, right? Yes, we messed up. And yes, we're still not doing whatever it takes to reverse what we've done. And yes, we're all screwed. Well, actually not all. I believe now that the, that the urge to homeostasis will win out and when Gaia establishes a new balance, then life will continue. We, won't, we don't know what it will look like, but life will continue. For Jonas as well, James asked. James, uh, Sylvia was silent. The pain of the question and the logical conclusion of her argument were clear, brutally clear. I don't know, she said with a resigned sigh. But we get no guarantee for a particular quality of life with a dependable duration. Disease, predation, war, these have always been with us to one extent or another, creating the new equilibrium for the whole organism, for Gaia. Sylvia paused as if lost in her thoughts before shaking her head to clear it. She refocused on her husband. Jimmy, I'm thinking we have to understand all this death and destruction as a fresh start in the history of life. James stared at her. And this explanation, this misery, this nihilism is comforting to you? Darling, it's not nihilism because it's not meaningless. It has the goal of sustaining life by whatever means available to the organism, to Gaia. It's the exact opposite of nihilism. Don't you see? I think I would better describe it as commitment. Gaia does what the prevailing conditions require with only one intent, achieve a new balance that preserves life. James took another sip of his scotch a small buzz beginning to form. He finished his drink and thought, tomorrow will be just another day. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Now we have, we have gone through everyone. I wanna thank you all for all of your amazing work that you shared with us today and the talent that you shared with us today. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions or comments um, that you'd like to ask any of us, I encourage you to, to do so. Um, we'll still be on 
for a few more minutes here. And I do want to give a big shout out to Anne Mallon, who I know is listening in our audience right now. She's with the Cream Literary Alliance and really helped bring all of us together. Um, so a really big shout out um, to Anne. And Roxanne, I didn't know if you wanted to say a few words before we completely wrap up. Yes, uh, thank you. I wanted to mention the Norton Museum of Art and Gladys Maria, uh, Ramirez, who um, helped us get together with Anne last fall, where we all met each other and initially presented this program in the auditorium at the Norton. So uh, they do wonderful community events, and I'm just very grateful uh, to them and to the Cream Literary Alliance and Anne Mellon, our mother, uh, who, who brought us all together. Um, it's really remarkable how eight random people somehow, when it's all said and done, our message is quite um, succinct and unified, so hopefully inspiring to others. Yes, I hope you are all leaving um, this program today, you know, inspired, whether it's by the poetry, prose, photography, and that wonderful meditation that Roxanne had. Um, we do have one comment here, or question, I should say. Richard, can you give us some concrete actions? Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Oh, good. All right. Uh, I think the best thing we can do is get behind the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act, uh, which has been proposed by some conservatives, including George Schultz, James Baker, Hank Paulson, you'll recognize those names, uh, Henry Mankiw, uh, all, all conservatives, uh, uh, former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors and many others, many Federal Reserve officers, scores of Nobel Prize winners all agree that we ought to tax carbon and rebate all the money to the citizens. Uh, a good slogan is always a good thing to have. I, I think the slogan for Florida should be uh, mask it or casket, uh, but uh, uh, the slogan for the carbon fee and dividend proposal is to tax the bads to free the goods. And uh, we're already very familiar with taxing the bads. Look what we do with alcohol and cigarettes and state lotteries and now marijuana uh, to, to suppress things that uh, and get some money for the damage they do and taxes, but not to ban them. Uh, but the carbon, the carbon rebating will enable people to uh, go solar, buy electric vehicles, and, and using a market-based mechanism, we can instantly change uh, and reform and uh, get back on the right track. Agreed. I also want to add in, um, please do not underestimate reaching out to your local municipalities, especially on the local level. There's a lot that can be done as well. So I know, you know, for me, working for the city of West Palm Beach, we don't know what our residents want unless you guys reach out to us. So it's always a good thing to, to reach out to your local representatives. And we do have another question um, from Christine. She says, would love to know what everyone is working on. Anyone wants to jump in on that one? I can. As far as far as uh, what uh, the, the theme of this whole thing, or what we're working on with our work, or what? I guess with your just your work in general. I can jump in if you like. I uh, I'm working on the finishing the trilogy that I that I started. The first part was uh, the theme was sustainable energy. Uh, the second part uh, on Vestige Way, the one I read from today, was how basically everything was too little, too late. And what happened after the, pen, after the uh, catastrophic environmental collapse, that is, if we don't do something drastic, is facing humanity. Uh, I'm working on three survival community strategies as the third in that. Um, I just want to say one thing. The, the poetry today was so extraordinary. And poetry, I think, is so underrated as a, there was a time when poets brought down nations. Mm. <laughs> it, it's the, the words of poetry, of poets, are so powerful. 
Um, I would just I would just encourage anyone who was inspired by the poetry, um, I, I won't make both, but to just go out and, and find some award-winning poets and find out why they won awards and, and just engage with them. Uh, the use of words like daggers, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. And today you've got a great example of it. Very true, very true, David. <laughs> Uh, I can answer. I'm, uh, I still am writing poetry. I have about uh, 50 to 60 images in my series. Um, being uh, stay at home orders, I haven't gotten out in nature as much as I would like to create some new images. Uh, but I do still have poems that I'm writing and I absolutely love talking about the work and um, would appreciate any leads that anyone has for being able to give talks, give presentations. Um, exhibitions. Um, I had a solo show at a gallery here in Santa Fe and just received the most wonderful comments um, universally, men, women, uh, young people, older people. So there's something going on in the resonance of um, learning to care for ourselves being in parallel in tandem with learning to care for our planet that um, seems very relevant right now. So thank you for asking that question. Anyone? Yeah, hi, this is this is Richard. I just want to say that uh, I'm very hopeful about the new administration coming in, and uh, I'm keeping myself at, uh, going and my spirits up by staying in the game and uh, really wanting to uh, participate and getting out the messages that we've been hearing today. So I take every chance I can to do that too. Kudos. Kudos, Richard. I agree. Um, you know, I don't care which way you vote. I don't care which party you're you're supporting. Uh, but getting involved at the local level is so important. That um, you know, I've worked with many small, you know, local governmental agencies, and they are all chock full of good people trying to do good work. So I have faith that our organizations will 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 pull us through on this. And if not, Gaia will teach us a big lesson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's mostly about power and money, I'm afraid. And uh, the power part is where legislation comes in, but the money part is important too. And uh, so many banks continue to fund fossil fuel projects. I think more people that contact members of the boards of, the, of big banking firms ask who are you funding? What are you lending your money to? Mm. But they realize that the people out there are paying attention to where that money is going. Maybe that will have some impact. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Great idea. Uh, yes. I, would like, I would like to uh, thank uh, Elaine and the uh, Office of uh, Sustainability from West Palm Beach and also my organization, uh, The Cream, uh, for allowing us to have a voice and uh, express uh, what we're doing here. It's, um, I think it's important, um, not only from the old timers, but especially from the younger folks that can hopefully uh, carry this on. Because uh, that, that, uh, what you said, uh, Richard, <laughs> I guess we're not gonna be around to see a whole lot of it, you know? Uh, hopefully we will. There's always hope, there's always hope. But I just want to say thank you to the audience uh, who is out there. Yes. And the panel, uh, everybody. It's it's been a it's been a lot of fun. It's been beautiful. And, yeah. Uh, hopefully great. we can do something again like this. You know. Yes. Yes. Love to. As far as myself, I I basically just uh, I, I write. I just keep writing. As a matter of fact, I, I put together uh, uh, poems that uh, were sitting around for like a couple of years that I was writing for my granddaughter, and I finally put it together, and it came out. I think it came out beautiful. So I just continue writing. Uh, I th are you answering that question, Elaine, to Lena? I am, yes. Oh, good, good. I guess I can answer it live here. <laughs> this presentation is being recorded um, and will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, an easy way to find the recording is going to be just to visit our Facebook page, but I can also email it out um, to everyone once it is up and ready to go. Um, so our Facebook page though for the City of West Palm Beach Office of Sustainability 
is just WPB Green. So all one word. Um, and you can also visit our website as well. It's just WPB.org slash green. And we'll also have it up on there too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. please please send it out and uh, thank you for doing that. And if you see an opportunity to get us together uh, in person sometime in a year from now, I, I would love to have lunch with everybody <laughs> and, and, and do this again. <laughs> well, we will we'll continue um, and hopefully we can put something very similar together in the near future as well. We need to keep this momentum going. Mm -hmm. Elaine, you did a great job. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. And, and do Elaine a favor and fill out the evaluation form because yeah. those, yeah. those things help these organizations that put right. so much time and effort and care into bringing us all together. So. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank it. You. it was great. Take gentle care and be safe and sane in these 